Hi, my name is Guillaume Lajoie. I'm a professor at the Department of Mathematics and Statistics at the University of Montreal and a core member of MILA, um, Quebec AI Institute. Uh, it's my pleasure today to talk to you about some recent research um, uh, concerning recurrence and attention and uh, artificial networks. Um, it's a pleasure to be contributing to this uh, symposium on machine learning and dynamical systems hosted by the Field Institute. And I hope you enjoy this talk. Um, to begin, I'd like to uh, start with acknowledgements. So the research I'm going to talk about today has been um, the work of uh, uh, several people, including some uh, graduate students. Um, uh, more precisely, it's been a project led uh, by Giancarlo uh, Kerk and uh, Bhargav uh, Kanupati and also with the help of Anirudh uh, Goyal and Karl Goyet, uh, and also in collaboration with uh, Joshua Bengio. Um, so I'll jump right into it. Um, what I'm interested in in this context are computations on input streams and sequences. Uh, and examples of that are natural language processing tasks, video tasks, navigation, these types of things. Now, uh, we all know that our brain, brains do this very well. Um, brain circuits are, uh, have these uh, fundamental ingredients that I think are, are uh, important for these types of tasks, namely that brain circuits are recurrent and show dynamics, so they can adapt to dynamical uh, um, uh, processes and computational needs. And another ingredient that I think is important, but seldom used, or it's starting to be used in AI, is the use of memory and attention to complement and guide these types of computations across long time scales, for example. And as I mentioned, right, AI took notes uh, to these, um, uh, 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 these ingredients, namely recurrent neural networks are the, the, the systems of choice to process uh, uh, sequences of information and so to perform computations on them. But recently also the, the idea of attention and use of memory or external memory has been uh, showing a resurgence, right? And so I want to touch base on this principal uh, idea here. Um, a little bit further. And by attentive systems here, what I mean is that um, in, in, uh, one can think about systems that have recurrent dynamics, but also interact with external memory that can store different types of things like past states of the system, past inputs. And it's these interactions that are showing a lot of promise into improving types of, of computations on, on, uh, on input streams. Uh, and is the subject of very active research field. Um, and so two big points that I'd like to address during these talks are the following. We have a pretty good understanding of how gradient propagates uh, in RNN and the, the limitations and challenges into training these types of networks when it comes to, to gradient propagation and, and gradient descent. But we have limited understanding of how these perform or behave rather uh, in the context of attentive networks or self-attentive networks. I want to touch on the sort of formalism of gradient propagation uh, in the presence of attention during this talk. The second point I'd like to discuss is the idea of inductive biases, right? So we have good inductive biases for RNNs based on what we know largely of, about gradient propagation in these RNNs. And by inductive biases, I mean architectural choices in uh, um, sort of regularization choices uh, and even initialization choices. But these sort of inductive bias uh, uh, um, uh, development are not quite at the same level in the presence of attention. So I'd like to touch on both of these points today in an effort to formalize this idea of computations on sequences of input in the presence of attention mechanisms. Okay. And um, since this is more of a pedagogical talk and the audience of this, this uh, uh, might be a little bit uh, uh, unfamiliar with deep learning in general and more have a, a, a dynamical systems background, I'll go a little bit through a brief introduction to what backpropagation is and what gradient descent, descent is in, the, in terms of deep networks and deep learning. This is a very broad and cartoon-esque overview, but if you're familiar with this, I encourage you to skip towards the end. So, the way I've done it is there's 
uh, a, uh, uh, I've put a, a blue circle at the top of the slides for this introduction, so you can just fast forward until you don't see that blue circle and, and jump right back in. Okay, so let's go through this this brief uh, sort of overview. So usually um, I'm going to talk about right now uh, uh, feed forward networks and then the principles apply for current networks, which is going to be the topic of this talk. But usually a, a, a neural networks, an artificial neural network, uh, in this case a feed forward one, is uh, consisting of hidden units, which are described by circles here, and connections between them, which are adjustable parameters, right? So the, the which are shown by arrows. So typically what a, a network does is it receives an input, and then um, this input propagates forward, uh, forwardly pro propagates through the network in the sense that it activates uh, different um, units based on the connections, and it gives an output. Now, the goal of deep, um, so before jumping into the goal, I'd like to, 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 to sort of put some, uh, some more meat on this, this principle. The idea is that if um, uh, these layers do some feature transformations, right? So if we think about the activations of these new units uh, as just some, some numbers, right, HL, so that's the, this is a vector of activations from layer L, then it's gonna um, uh, influence layer L plus one, via this matrix multiplication, right? So this is just the weights of layer L that multiplies this, the activations of layer L. And then this matrix multiplication is, multiplication is passed through a nonlinearity. Typically this might be a rectified linear uh, uh, unit, um, uh, uh, nonlinearity or sigmoidal or something, something of the sort. There's, there's a, a variety of nonlinearities that are used in practice. And then uh, finally there's sort of a what is called the bias term, which is just another vector that, that is um, added to this layer. Okay, and so these are typical, this is the basis of, of, uh, of artificial neural networks. We have sort of a linear combination of activations of a previous layer passed through a, a nonlinearity onto the next layer, right? And so if we think about a, a task that we would like a network to do, here I'm using the sort of overused example of classifying pictures of, of either cats or dogs. Um, and so the job of the network is to take the pixels of these pictures and then spit out um, an, an, a binary answer. Is it a cat or a dog, right? So in this particular example, what we'd like to do is um, a, a task of inference, right? And so the idea is that all of the parameters of my network here, which are denoted by the vector uh, theta, these include all of these connection weights, these biases, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and uh, we would like to find uh, the set of these parameters such that the function that the network is outputting, rather here, here, if the output is y hat is just a binary output, we would like uh, to find the best parameter value such that um, it gives us the, the answer that we're looking for. Right. So the way to do this typically in a supervised learning task is that we would present a training set. A training set is essentially a set of examples with the right answer associated with them. And then we would uh, use this set uh, and uh, see the, uh, and propagate all of these examples through our network, see the output of it. And then we would like to adjust the parameters such that the answers are matching what the real answers should be. That's typically what optimization or training of a neural network in a supervised setting is. So examples of these losses might be, you know, mean squared error, which is very simple or cross entropy. The idea is that you have a function that you're trying to minimize, right? Or optimize in some way, you can, you can flip it around. Um, and the way to do this typically, and especially in, in general, is to do some gradient descent, right? So we want to uh, to, to, if we think about the, the landscape of this loss function with, with, with respect to um, all of our parameters, we'd like to find a minimum of this, right? So this is what we're after. And then one way to do this is um, to do some gradient descent, as I just mentioned, right? So we would like to compute the gradient of this loss with respect to these parameters and just follow it down, okay? <clears throat> so that's the big principle, right? And so it turns out that if you've heard the term backpropagation, backpropagation is just a way to compute that gradient. Actually, it's just 
the it just falls out of the architecture of the network and it goes a little bit like this right so gradients of this error function are essentially derivatives of the scalar output function with respect to all of these different um, parameters in my system um, and so usually to evaluate this first of all one needs to do what's called the forward pass so that means that we present inputs to the network and then we compute the activations and get an output now taking that output and all of these these activations one can compute the the, uh, the derivative of this loss with respect to all of these things and again this gradient is composed of uh, subparts which are the uh, partial derivatives of that loss function with respect to different parameters in the system. But it turns out that if, for example, we would like to compute this um, component, which is the derivative of the loss with respect to this particular weight here, then to get to that weight, just by sheer differentiation, uh, um, one basically needs to go from the end of the system back to there, right? So just this is just a product of a chain rule. If we differentiate uh, the, the loss that, that takes into account this guy, then um, to get to a particular weight, we need to, to go through the chain differentiation uh, that goes through all of these different parameters. And this is why it's called back propagation, because you take the error and to compute uh, uh, sequentially all of these terms in the gradient you just propagate the error backwards due to the chain rule okay um, and so this is what is typically referred to as the backwards pass and essentially it's just computing the gradient of a loss function and uh, once one has the gradient then uh, typically you just take an update of your parameters following that gradient right so taking a small step uh, down, uh, downhill rather to, to minimize your error function. And there's all kinds of issues and tricks here because there's, you know, uh, uh, la the, these, these landscapes here are not necessarily very smooth and you can't take too big of a step because then you would, you, you'd fall off this uh, linear approximation of, of this curvature, which is what this, um, this gradient is. So anyway, the point is this is a vast area of research, but this, the main mechanism to train neural networks is by gradient descent, by trying to minimize a loss. And usually computing that, that gradient involves doing some back propagation through the network. Okay, now let's go back to our, our system of interest, which is a recurrent network. So in comparison to um, a feed forward network, recurrent networks have connections between neurons that are not necessarily organized in hierarchical layers, right? They're all, they can be, uh, uh, as the name says, recurrent in the sense that each neuron can be connected to other neurons in the network. And typically, uh, uh, this is used for processing inputs that are of a sequential nature. So in inputs here, oh, I'm sorry, here, that's, um, there's been a little problem. Let me restart this. Okay. Okay. And so uh, typically inputs here are indexed by time. And one thing that falls directly out of having a recurrent network is that you inevitably fall into a, 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 a situation where you have dynamics, right? Because the, the state of each of these neurons, um, oh, I'm sorry, there's a problem here in my little set system. Okay. The state of each of these neurons um, uh, depends on the state of all the other neurons. So it endows inevitably the idea of time. You need to update the network and then these states uh, uh, depend on past states of the, of the system. Um, and one can think about this in, in terms of, of dynamical systems really, right? So these recurrent networks become dynamical systems. Typically, we use these updates uh, in discrete time, but there are uh, instances where um, these neural networks are seen in continuous time, namely reservoir computing is an example of that. Um, uh, and so the, the, the point that I'm, that's important to understand is that recurrent neural networks are dynamical systems, but they act in very similar ways as feed forward networks in the sense that one tries to optimize these parameters to perform a certain task. The only difference is that this back propagation business that we've just discussed in feed forward network, the way to compute gradients to optimize a neural network now is done through time. 
Um, so a lot of, uh, of, of time, like this is the acronym back propagation through time. And the idea to think about this is to unroll the network through large amount of times, and then you back propagate the error through here. So essentially a recurrent network is a network that has many layers that are represented through time. And then these layers have a special thing in the sense that they share the same weights, right? So it's another way of, of looking at this problem, right? It's, it's exactly the same weights between them because again, it's a dynamical system, but from a back propagation point of view, it's exactly the same thing as a feed forward network where you have a copy of the same layer that happens over and over again. Okay. So one of the big problems that's been discovered in training um, uh, recurrent networks with back propagation through time over long sequences is that these gradients, um, error gradients that are used to optimize the, the, the parameters of the network uh, suffer from exploding and vanishing problems, right? And so this is not surprising. If you compound the effect of recursively uh, uh, using the same layer uh, uh, weights over and over again, you get generically these problems. Either your gradients explode or they vanish and you lose any signals that you, might be useful to update your, your system. Explosion is a problem that's dealt with in some, some cases more easily. Vanishing is, I would say, the, the more prevalent problem. So you lose completely the signal. So this is usually what people try to avoid actively when, when uh, training recurrent networks. And I should say that these problems in gradient vanishing and explosion also happens in feed forward network that are very, very deep, but it's usually a problem that's more prevalent in, in recurrent networks, okay? And so if we unpack a little bit the shape of these gradients and see what leads to these explosions and, and, and vanishing problems, we see that a leading term is the, the compounded effect of these Jacobian matrices, right? So this is, uh, you know, just, I don't want to dwell too much on the details here, but if we unpack the gradient of a loss function with respect to the parameters of a network, these are the terms that are typically at play. And a term that comes back a lot is the derivative of my um, loss function with respect to the activations of the, the system. So this is essentially the Jacobian of the dynamics of the system, right? And so these, uh, if we unpack this term, turns out that usually it's the leading term that leads to these gradient problems. You see that you have a bunch of these products of, of matrices, which are precisely the Jacobian of my dynamical system. And as T gets larger, basically the spectral properties of these Jacobian matrices make it so that you get these exponential exploding problem or vanishing problem. So this is, you know, linear stability problems in, in the dynamical system, it's, it's fairly well understood, okay? And um, why is this the problem? Well, as I mentioned, right, the idea is that from a learning perspective, it's hard to use information about the past while learning because it's difficult to know, in a sense, what to memorize. You lose the signal about what's important, what impacts your loss function at the end of the day because you degrade the, the, the information that's that's in, the, in, the, in the, the gradient of the loss function. And to make a parallel with, with, um, uh, with dynamical systems theory, again, the issue is that you have these long products of Jacobians that don't necessarily commute in time. So you can't do any like tricks on them, right? And uh, for those of you who are familiar with Lyapunov exponents and Lyapunov spectra, these are very closely related objects, right? So the epidemic exponents are, are sort of spectral properties of these long products of non-commuting Jacobians. Um, and so that's a very interesting topic that I won't dive into today, but I thought I'd mention it right here. Right, so what do people do typically to address these problems, right? So there's a few tricks uh, in practice in, in artificial intelligence. Mainly, uh, a first might be, uh, like first category is gradient manipulation. So you can clip gradients, you can regularize parameters to make sure gradients don't blow up or shrink. You can do all kinds of things that are basically magical manipulation of gradients to, to help prevent that problem. And to a certain extent, that's part of the typically used toolbox of optimizing uh, recurrent networks. 
Another um, uh, trick is to use inductive biases in the architecture of these recurrent networks to allow learning ways to propagate uh, networks better. So uh, a good example of this are gated dynamics, right? So gated uh, neural networks, uh, the more popular one are long short-term memory network or LSTMs, where essentially within the architecture of the network, you have these, these activations, right? That are called gates, which uh, multiplicatively influence uh, how gradients flow through the network. So basically, you're promoting identity operations whenever there's no systems and uh, no, no system, no computations that are relevant, so that your signals propagate longer. Another example is our gated recurrent units, which are, a, in a sense, a simpler uh, a mechanism based on the same idea of long short term memory. And then there's also the all this is very active area of research. And there's many other types of networks in the same same uh, same line. Another solution is to uh, to have inductive biases that are um, uh, parametrizing your connectivity matrix in such a way that you promote sort of um, less exponential problems, either exploding or, or vanishing, right? So uh, there's a long line of work which uh, uses uh, orthogonal matrices as connection connectivity matrix so that your spectra are uh, are promoting like stable and, and robust propagation of, um, of gradients. Um, and uh, so there's a long line of work into optimizing parameters on low dimensional subspaces of parameter space. So you want to stay on the manifolds of all the connectivity matrix that are orthogonal, for example. Okay, so I would say that all of these types of ingredients or, or methods are, can be referred to as, as, as uh, ways to, um, uh, to refine what's what I'll call parametric memory, right? So what, at the end of the day, what you're trying to do is you're trying to train, adjust the weights of a network, which the parameters of a network well-defined to memorize certain properties about input to perform a task. Right, so you have a memory system, right, that's parametrized by the weights of the network, and you're tuning these parameters to perform a certain task. Right. On the other hand, there are some non-parametric solutions to the problem of of training over long time scales, and so I'll, I'll give you an example of this. Right. So the point here would be to say, let's try to use skip connections, right, in time, saying it doesn't. It's, let's try to not go through the entire recurrence of all of these uh, uh, operations to get to here, if we can just use a connection from here to here. Now, in feed forward networks, these skip connections, as they're called, are, are, are used in many different contexts, and they do just that. They allow gradients to pass faster. However, in the recurrent net network setting where these, remember this is an unrolled version of an RNN, so that's this axis is time. These skip connections are essentially connections to something that is stored in memory, right? So it's stored from the past. Hence the idea of the use of an external memory, right? So the, the point here is that this picture translates to a neural network that has access in some way to an external memory bank of past inputs, past states to help computation. And this is why these uh, uh, memory systems, I, we call them non-parametric in the sense that you're using this external memory that stores these states. It, it can grow uh, unbounded depending on, on implementation and so on and so forth. But these memories are explicitly stored to access by the system and they're not encoded in a parametric way and hence they're non-parametric solutions. So these types of Aug memory augmented systems, there's, there's a few examples of them. There's this ongoing research about them. But I would say that um, uh, very important breakthroughs in uh, sequence of processing uh, are due to um, uh, the use of attention as a mechanism uh, to write and address these external memories. So um, as an example, right, so there's these um, uh, a very seminal paper called uh, the, uh, here Neural Machine Translation by Jointly Learning and Align to Translate. So this is, was an iClear paper in 2015, uh, which uh, 
basically uh, modernized and popularized the, the use of attentive mechanisms to address these, these non parametric memory banks. And then later on, the same ideas were pushed even further in this seminal paper called Attention is All You Need, which essentially describes uh, systems that rely solely on attention uh, called transformers, which are the basis of uh, current state of the art in uh, natural language processing tasks. So these attentive systems in non-parametric memory settings are currently the, the best performing types of systems. And they require um, uh, some sort of, uh, uh, there's a lot of, of research on this, but it's, there's not a lot of, a lot of this is in heuristics, right? So there's a lot of formal questions as to why these things work and what are the guarantees of propagations. And so this is what I'd like to, to get to today. Okay. And so before doing this, um, let me just briefly cover the basics of attention mechanisms, uh, uh, specifically self-attention mechanisms, because one can attend to static inputs in, in different ways. Um, and there's all kinds of flavors of attention, but this will give you a little bit of the, the, an overview of how it works. So as I mentioned, the idea, if you were to magically be able to store all of these past states in memory and you want to use them in your computation, attention mechanism is essentially a way to learn how to address them in a way that uh, helps you solve your task, right? So in equations, let's, let's take an example. So again, we have a recurrent network, for example, with a hidden state h of t plus one, which is uh, uh, these matrix products passed to a nonlinearity. We have the input that comes in here, some bias, and this is a past state that comes into this form. So s of t is sort of an intermediate state that's composed of both the past states and what we call the context vector here, c of t. Now, a context vector is composed of a linear combination typically of all the past states that I've seen before. So these are these skip connections, right? And the weights of these linear connection, uh, uh, linear combinations, these alpha sub i of t's are precisely what uh, they're called attention uh, scores or attention weights. And this is what uh, 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 attentive networks learn to perform, uh, learn to, to tune, right? So typically attention weights are computed by the softmax of these, uh, uh, of these these quantities E sub i's, which are essentially based from, uh, uh, given from an alignment function. And this is this function that's also getting learned end to end through back propagation, right? Um, so a few notes here. Typically, uh, this intermediate state is a simple, uh, is obtained simply by concatenating the, the past states plus the context vector or, 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 uh, or adding them together. And typically these alignment functions are, uh, are developed as uh, a neural networks themselves, right? So they're learned function to attend to the past. Okay, so this is all trained end to end. And as I mentioned, um, they, uh, they perform extremely well, right? And one thing to note is one can replace this part here by your RNN of choice, right? So your current net neural networks of choice could be an LSTM, it could be GRUs, you can, you know, it's this, in this particular case, this is just a vanilla RNN, so just the typical recurrent networks. But, but uh, choices of, of architectures here are very flexible. Um, a thing to note here is that attention, as one might think, is actually very expensive and grows quadratically, complexity grows quadratically with sequence length. And that's not surprising because as you go further in time and you want to attend to all of these past states, then these, these parameters here keep growing. So that is one of the main bottlenecks of attentive networks is that there is this idea of complexity that scales very poorly. Nevertheless, there's you know, a lot of research into developing tricks to sparsify this, this, uh, this problem, um, uh, this, this attention. Um, and so uh, uh, this, is, uh, this, this is something to note and that's an issue to be treating um, uh, if we want to scale these systems uh, very highly, okay? Um, and so I'd like to take, take sort of a, a step back here and think about this, this spectrum of, of non-parametric versus parametric memory, right? Um, and uh, on one end of the spectrum, these, uh, as I described, this parametric business is 
purely recurrent networks with no attention mechanism, so no uh, uses of external memory. And then at the other end of the spectrum, you have systems such as transformers, which actually get rid of recurrence altogether, right? So transformers are, are uh, uh, and, and variants of essentially say, no need for recurrence, let's just attend to everything, right? So there's problems with this. It's hard to think about that as a, a processing and a input flux um, that, that doesn't stop. You need essentially, you take a long input and you learn simultaneously on all of it, right? Uh, but it is extremely powerful. But increasingly there's research on, on these, what we call semi-parametric memories uh, systems, where you use both recurrence and attention and balance out these, the role of the two to learn better and to scale uh, better as well, right? And um, advantages of both ends of the spectrum can go as follows. They can be summarized as follows, right? So non parametric memory leads to very robust learning and strong gradients, right? That's heuristics that was there to develop them in the first place, so it, it works. But complexity scales poorly. On the other end of the spectrum, you have the problems of these exploding vanishing gradients that are hard to deal with, but you have very cheap compact encoding based on this parametric memory business that I've, I've discussed. And again, there's something in the middle here, uh, which is uh, a very active area of research. And I think there's a lot of open questions in terms of formal representation of gradients uh, uh, and the trade-offs between the two ends of that spectrum. And this is one I wanna uh, discuss a little bit more in details now. Okay, so in the, in the uh, hopes of striking a balance, there's this push to sparsify attention in the context of recurrent self-attentive networks, right? Uh, here are a few examples. Again, these are very current topics and there's uh, papers coming out all the time. Um, but I'd like to introduce, uh, um, introduce a very recent paper from colleagues that led to the formal representations that, that I'm going to discuss in, in a second. And that's the idea of sparse attentive backtracking, which is a very simple way to sparsify the self-attention in semi-parametric model. And the idea is as follows. One have a, can start with a self-attentive recurrent neural network in this case case, uh, the authors use an LSTM, and you add self-attention, the same, very similar to, uh, similarly to what I described, but you add two ingredients. One can say that um, at every time step, um, attentions can only attend to a finite number of past states, in this case called K-top, right? So you can't attend to everything, you, can, you just have the choice of the first top K uh, uh, states, and then that's what you use in the computation. And the second ingredient is a sort of scheduled memory writing. So instead of committing everything to memory, at, uh, you just uh, uh, you just commit every uh, past state at a uh, at a regular interval. In this case, described by k attention, right? So say k attention is ten. I'm only storing in memory for past accessed by attention mechanisms every time, 10 time steps, for example. So this helps uh, to keep memory complexity low, and this helps to keep uh, uh, compute complexity low. And these two heuristics lead to very interesting uh, um, uh, advantages. Uh, Curiously, there are also very good advantages for generalization on top of being able to learn on longer sequences, right? And so, um, as I mentioned, there's very effective heuristics for a number of reasons, but they, um, the question that remains is, can they be formalized, right? So, so far, all of these, uh, most of these, these uh, attempts, including SAD, have proposed heuristics and showed that they work, but there's no real um, guarantees on gradient propagations in these types of settings. And this is what um, we're proposing to, uh, to change, right? And so, uh, finally, what I'd like to, <laughs> to present today is novel, uh, novel results in this sphere of trying to understand or to formalize ways that gradients propagate in the presence of both recurrence and attention, right? And so you can find more details in this paper that's on the archive. And um, I'd like to first start by describing some scaling properties of gradients in this context. 
Okay, so the first case, let's think of a simple case where um, one has a task where each event in the past has uniform relevancy. And by that, I mean that if you were to compute the attention weights, right, these alphas uh, from um, uh, on the task, you would see that each event has sort of an equal participation in the computation, right? So this is a case that's kind of a baseline, right? In, in practice, this is not necessarily the case, but um, it's, uh, it's the first step to try to understand in terms of how can we develop uh, um, ideas of how gradient norms propagate in these particular cases, right? And so we have a, a theorem in this case that says that if, you know, suppose that for all t we have these attention weights that are uh, uniform, right? Then uh, we're guaranteed to have um, gradient norms that are scaling as one over t, right? And omega here, this notation is just a lower bound, right? So by that, I mean that, you know, a, a function is omega, uh, f is omega of g, if there is exists a constant that uh, uh, such that f is lower bounded by c times g for all t. Okay, so again, here we're trying to mitigate or find particular scaling properties that mitigate gradient vanishing. And this is one of them that, that, that gets out, right? So uh, you can go see the proof of that theorem in, um, in this paper. Now, um, this is nice to see, like there's a one over t uh, a scaling law for gradients in these particular contexts. But this is for a uniform case, which again, is not necessarily what happens in practice. And so the second case is uh, uh, what we call sparse relevancy is more uh, akin to what we see in practice. And so this is refers to the case where you have tasks that um, may depend on some past states, but not all of them, right? This is what um, the SAB sparse attempting at attentive backtracking was, attempt, uh, was, was aiming to exploit, right? Saying there's some events in the past that are more important than others. And these are the only ones that are important to attend to, right? You lighten the load of computation, you lighten the load of, of memorization. Um, but what are the advantages of both of these sort of parameters on gradient propagation, right? So before answering these questions, we'll, um, I just want to give you a little example to show what the structure of attention is in these particular cases, right? So, and I, I want to, to, to show you um, uh, an example toy task that's used generally in these in these settings. It's called a denoise task. And the, the, the task is very simple. It goes as, as follows, right? So a network receives a string of inputs, which are symbols. Um, there's two categories of symbols. There's the zeros here that, that uh, are need to be considered as noise. And then there's a series of, of other symbols, which are denoted by red X's here, which are the ones that are important. And uh, the network receives a string of these inputs and its task upon reception of a Q is to spit out in order these important symbols that were presented, right? So the, the, the idea is that you need to memorize a sequence of, of input uh, and denoise it in the sense that you need to get rid of everything in between. And the position of these symbols may vary, right? So it changes from one end to the, to the other. So you cannot just memorize the position of where these things are from one input to the next. You need to, uh, the network needs to learn to, to recognize these and to store them in a way that's, that's efficient. So if we, we train um, a self-attentive recurrent network to do this task, this is what the attention weights uh, look like. So in this axis, you have the states that are uh, attending to, and this axis is the states that are attending from. So as I go here, as I make a computation at this point in time, I'm attending to all of these states with this uh, strength. So this is a, a color bar, the strength of the attention weight, these alpha sub i's, right? And one can see without too much surprise that um, these attention, uh, uh, weights concentrates on the times at which the these symbols x's were presented right that's not surprising that's the that's the nature of the task but there's a, a lot of sparsity that happens here and this is typical to other a lot of other real world tasks where there's a lot of irrelevant stuff that you need to wash out and 
the relevant stuff you need to attend to and, and choose to uh, uh, to keep in memory to use as as uh, in your computation. So this is the type of task structure that we refer to in, in, in this second case of sparse relevancy. So to make this formal, I'll just introduce a few definitions and notations, and then we'll be able to formulate these uh, a similar scaling bound for gradients. So uh, bear with me here. So we'll define a past uh, or, or a state uh, HI, so this is a hidden state of a recurrent network, as relevant at time t if uh, sorry for the typo here, if alpha sub i of t is sufficiently greater than zero. So sufficiently greater than zero depends on, on, on details, but for now, let's just say that it's not zero, right? And we'll call um, a sequence of indices, uh, i sub one to i sub s, a dependency chain of depth s. If there exists a backpropagation gradient path that visits all of these, these uh, substates, right? So this is important to understand that in the presence of attention, there's many different paths between two states, right? If I didn't have these, these sort of skip connections, there's only one path. I need to go recurrently when I back propagate, I need to go through all of these past time steps to get from this state to this state, for example. But if I have the opportunity to skip, then I can go from here and then recurrence, recur to here, or I can go directly to here if I have a skip connection there and so on and so forth. So enumerate, enumerating these paths and, and calculating their contribution to gradient propagation is the, the crux of these, these proofs, right? So, um, so again, these are the, the, the way to formalize this is through the idea of a dependency chain that we call. And then we call a dependency depth D uh, between states uh, is the, um, the shortest chain length such that, um, uh, sorry again for the typo, linking relevant events to it at, at a time T, okay? Um, and then Another uh, coefficient that we'll use, or, or a parameter that we'll use, is what we call a sparsity coefficient, k, and that's the maximal number of attended state at any given time. And this is exactly the k top from that sparse attended backtracking setup that I've discussed before. Okay. So equipped with these definitions, we can prove the following theorem, right? So if we consider a hidden state HT with maximal dependency depth of D and K sparse attention, then we know that the norm of the, the, this term in the gradient is going to be lower bounded by one over K to the D, okay? So this was a, a, a theorem that was proven by uh, uh, Giancarlo, which is uh, um, uh, a student that, that led this, uh, this theory part of this paper. It's highly non-trivial, but it gives us uh, a, a very nice scaling property for, for these gradients. I recall that this, is, this might be just a term in the gradient, but it's a dominant term for, that is responsible for vanishing and exploding usually. Um, so this is very nice to know and can inform a lot of heuristics or a lot of inductive biases for future use. So this is one of the main contributions of this particular paper I'm discussing here is that this scaling property here. Okay, so what are the main lessons or the, the, the intuition that comes out of this theorem is, uh, well, first is that both keeping K and D small promote good gradient propagation. Right, and so th these these things are are important. The bigger they become, the more this scaling uh, goes down. Okay, um, uh, and in a sense, also there's a balancing act here, right? Uh, because K and D are related. The smaller I make K, right, that's the number of things I can attend to at any given point. The more I promote longer dependency chains, because I can't make a shortcut directly to a past state. I need to go through recurrence, right? So this, this is true. Um, but also if I make K too large, then I'm augmenting, I'm, I'm increasing the complexity of my system, right? So K is the number of stuff I need to attend to at any given point, and uh, it dictates the number of stuff I'm keeping into memory as well. So this is something to keep in mind, right? So this, there's a trade-off between these things. And um, what we learn, right, is that the important part is that to quantify relevancy, right? So what we, a lesson that we can take from all of this is that a good strategy is not 
is to only store and attend to relevant events, which are the ones that are going to contribute to these types of, of scalings. Okay. And so keeping this in mind, what we propose is that uh, screening for relevancy in these types of long term memory addressing uh, problem strike that balance between this, uh, this K and this D here, right? And, um, and in the paper, we articulate uh, what are the, the ingredients for these relevancy screening mechanisms. And it's basically, we're proposing a family of these, um, these, uh, these methods. Um, and there are certainly related recent work, uh, mainly from the uh, reinforcement learning literature, which are touching on the same principles. Um, and, and right now I'm going to show you an example of such a screening mechanism, but again, the, the statement is a bit more general than that, right? So here's a simple screening mechanism. And, and we, we, we use, again, we use this as a grain of salt. salt. I don't think it, have, it will be effective on, on uh, all tasks, but it is an example of, as to how a, uh, such a mechanism can be implemented. So let me go through a little bit of the details here. So, so suppose I have, you know, a recurrent network that has, you know, uh, that's unrolled two times where all of these hidden states of that network here are, are, delimited, uh, are denoted by H1, H2, and so on. And suppose that I'm currently at H3 and I have an attentive mechanism that can enable me to attend to past states. I'll introduce here what we call a short-term buffer which is a finite set of past states here um, for which there's full attention on these states. So if I'm at state H3, I have information from this past recurrent state, plus I can attend to all of these past states, right? And then as I go on, my buffer changes, right? Again, at H4, I can attend to all of these three past states. Here, my short-term buffer is of length three. Once I move once more, my state H1 here is kicked out of the buffer and now a decision needs to be made. Is H1 going to be relegated to what we call a long-term memory here, such that there can be attention to it for all the rest of the time? Um, and the way we do it right now is um, in this particular example is we say, okay, we, we look at the uh, accumulated times or attention scores of that state H1 for all the times it's spent in the short-term buffer. And if it supersedes a certain threshold, we say the state is likely relevant to the computation and we relegate it to the long-term memory. And whatever is in this long-term memory can be attended through a case sparse attention mechanism at from for any state in the future. Okay. And then we continue like this. Maybe H2 here doesn't pass this relevancy test. So then H2 is forgot forgotten forever right so h2 cannot be attended to for the for the next uh, for for the rest of the the sequence processing and so on and so forth right and so the idea here is that there's two hierarchies of attention that um uh this that enables some sort of a screening mechanism to keep complexity low and to uh appeal to this trade-off that i i showed you based on this theorem in the case of sparse uh relevancy Okay, and again, this this is based on a heuristic that um, that whatever is locally attended to is going to be relevant in the future. That's not necessarily the case for some tasks, right? So one might think about other types of heuristics for these relevancy screening that that's based on sort of predictive power or importance or surprise of events. So there's all kinds of different heuristics that can be applied here. But the important thing is that you're forecasting the relevancy of an event yeah, and, and using this forecast to decide whether or not to, to commit it to long-term memory. So here's a, a few examples of, of how this acts in terms of, of training on, on tasks. So I'm again here using this, this toy task of denoise. Oops, again, I'm sorry, this is my big hands that touched the buttons that shouldn't. Okay, uh, and uh, so what I'm showing you here are gradient propagations. Um, uh, actually, they go this way, uh, based on the number of time steps. So we're uh, training a variety of different networks. Here we have a vanilla RNN, LSTMs, 
uh, mem RNN, which is just a self-attentive RNN, so an, uh, an RNN which has all the attention of, of past states. Uh, we're tra training SCB, this sparse attentive backtracking that I've discussed, and then our particular installment of relevancy uh, screening, which we call rel LSTM. So this is relevancy screening sitting on top of a self-attentive LSTM. So we can see that both the, the, the parametric systems, right, the RNN and the LSTM, have gradients that either blow up or, or, uh, or vanish as uh, one back propagates through time, right? So here we're, we're looking de de at the denoise task with sequence length of a thousand, so that's pretty long. And uh, we rapidly lose signals for both these systems that do not have access to external memory. However, as expected, all these three systems, which have access to self-attention, right? So these non parametric memory uh, mechanisms have very healthy gradient propagation. Uh, again, this is log scales, which enables uh, a good learning, right? So in terms of, of performance, uh, these two here fail to, per to, to learn quite uh, uh, the task, but here, all of these guys here learn very well, right? Now, in terms of GPU usage for these properties, we see the following, right? So as expected, both RNN and LSTMs are very stable in terms of GPU usage, right? Because the complexity of these things is already uh, pre-computed, right? It's parametric, right? So there's no complexity scaling. Both of these uh, sort of vanilla attention system, as I would say, grow quadratically, right? With different rates, right? Uh, SAB, you know, helps because there's some sparsification mechanism, but it still grows uh, quadratically in terms of complexity. So we can see this here, but um, we see the advantage of having a relevancy screening mechanism, uh, uh, which is this uh, our system here, because we see that, you know, complexity grows much slower. So. Again, we're retaining the advantages of having self-attention uh, uh, while keeping complexity low by having this screening mechanism. Okay, and another way to plot this, which I like a lot, is is uh, is uh, this max GPU usage versus the average log of the gradient. So here, I'm we're plotting both these different um, systems um, uh, for different lengths of, uh, of this copy task. So here, 400, 600, 800. So again, these are sequences of that length that are presented to the network. And then at the end, network needs to spit a sequence of uh, relevant symbols. And um, these markers here show the RNN. So the higher I go, that means that this is the average log loss of the, the, uh, of the gradient of the loss rider and uh, and so this is exploding gradient territory and right next to it is the performance of the network to the task so as we go here and the marker size uh, uh, shape is again the the length of the sequence as we go longer and longer and longer performance degrades and that's associated with exploding gradient same is true for lstm and again we can see that um, uh, gradients are pretty healthy across the board for uh, non-parametric system or semi-parametric system, but max GPU usage grows as the length of the task grows. But for our system, it remains pretty much uh, uh, the same. So this is very encouraging and it outlines very well, I think, the striking balance between this idea of, of parametric and non-parametric uh, memory usage. Okay, uh, I also want to point out that there's surprising advantages of having these relevancy screening mechanisms, you know, beyond the complexity reduction. And it seems like on reinforcement learning tasks uh, here, uh, mini grid tasks, um, there are rel LSTM has Im Im uh, impressive test scores. That means that it can generalize to new environment where the task was not, uh, was not necessarily trained on. So again, that's, you know, we don't, necessarily understand exactly why, but we think that this compact representation of memory might help to generalize to, to other settings of the task. So this is ongoing work. We're trying to understand that. Um, so in summary, uh, I'd just like to, to outline here key contributions to the, the field of self-attentive systems that we've made. 
Um, first of all, uh, we've provided some theorems that are, have been uh, so far uh, elusive to this field, right? There's been a, a development of been mainly based on heuristics, but now we have some scaling properties in some cases. Um, uh, and so uh, to the best of our knowledge, this is the for first formal treatment of gradient propagation in the presence of attention in recurrent networks. Um, and these reveals uh, reveal trade-offs of attention and recurrence. And we use these to propose a family of methods, namely that we call relevancy screening methods, uh, that are uh, um, that we show help to streamline attention and, and, and complexity and, and inform the trade-off between the two. And um, and show intriguing experimental results uh, that suggest some advantages for generalizations and other things that are not necessarily based on the theorems that that we uh, we proposed. Okay, um, and I just want to end here on a little outlook with this line of work. Um, again, I mentioned that uh, the relevancy screening mechanism that we proposed is just one example, but the heuristic or like the mechanism of, of screening for the relevancy, we believe is crucial to scaling these self-attentive systems. Um, and examples of, of relevancy screening, as I mentioned, might be predictive power of a certain state um, or task-specific mechanisms uh, that, that depend on, on you know, if, if, if one performs a reinforcement learning task and navigation task, something that is surprising, right, that has, you know, a lot of information that is not necessarily predicted might be important. So, so we're exploring these, um, these avenues. Um, and uh, another very important way to push this forward is to think about better way to store an address memory for self-attention. So, so far, even though we're trying to, to control the flux uh, of, of states into these long-term memories to attend to, we're still keeping into memory like a copy of a past state, right? Uh, but there's exciting ongoing words into ways to streamline how we store and we represent these memories. So sometimes, past states might be very close, so you might want to merge them somehow. So there's, there's some work into slot-based attention that's very uh, important uh, and interesting. And uh, so I think, for example, so I think there's uh, a lot of work to be done and to try to consolidate both addressing uh, um, relevancy and uh, representation in, in, in memory augmented networks. Uh, and uh, in a sense, uh, this is what likely happens in the brain, right? The brain is very good at incorporating these memories, at merging memories and getting rid of stuff that it doesn't need. Um, and, and so uh, taking cues from how cognition works in terms of long-term uh, uh, computation over long-term, uh, uh, long time scales is going to be uh, very interesting to pursue. So with this, um, I'd like to thank everybody for your attention and uh, I hope you have a great rest of the workshop.